clear. If someone raises okay. their hand, I, I, I will track this. Okay, so if there is some question, you can also moderate and you can yeah. ask it. Uh, okay. okay. Um, so let's, let's get a start then. So you might have seen uh, these robots already. Uh, so these are the, what used to be the Amazon uh, Kiva robots and the thousands of them automate uh, the, some of the warehouses around the world of Amazon. And uh, up to date, uh, this is already 10 years old, more or less, this video. But up to date, uh, this is uh, still uh, one of the uh, most successful uh, commercially available products uh, where multiple robots uh, actually work in a real environment. And then if you order a package in the US, uh, it's very likely that uh, your package from Amazon is actually picked in a warehouse like this uh, through a team of uh, mobile robots. Now, but if you look very closely or, or not so closely, actually you, you probably noticed it already, there were only these orange robots moving around shelves. So there are no humans in this environment. If, if something goes wrong, they have to stop the whole area and then the, the human can go in. And the humans are in the periphery, so the robots will bring the packages to the humans that then uh, do all the packing. So they are completely separated, the humans and the robots. That's the same if we look at other uh, displays or other commercially available products. So this is a display with multiple robots with hundreds of uh, drones. You might have seen it from Disney or Intel or us in Rotterdam some months ago, there was such a display. But again, there are no humans in the sky, so uh, that's difficult. And furthermore, in this case, everything is uh, pre-planned, so nothing changes in real time. And if we look at uh, um, mobile robots in general, maybe some of you have a Tesla, like the one here on the uh, right corner. Uh, so these ones uh, work most of the time, uh, so it's not yet 100% anyway, but mostly on low complexity environments, so like a highway, where the car mostly has to follow the lanes and avoid the vehicles in front. If we go to indoor environments where we have social robots, those uh, are interacting with uh, much more uh, crowded environments, more interaction, but the speeds are typically very slow. So these robots will just stop and let you pass when they uh, meet you. So moving forward, the uh, uh, mobile robots uh, will need to achieve uh, complex tasks uh, and they will need to seamlessly cooperate with other robots uh, and also with us humans because some of these tasks will be in environments shared with humans. And all this needs to happen in a safe, efficient, and reliable manner. So within uh, my group, uh, uh, we are uh, working towards robots that can cooperate uh, with each other and uh, seamlessly interact with other robots and also with humans to, to achieve complex tasks. Here you can see some, uh, maybe a, a vision of the future where uh, many robots will interact. You will have robots delivering packages, your self-driving car, maybe robots for the police, or uh, carrying your suitcase when it's very heavy. And all these will have to interact in this complex world with other robots and also with humans. We are still far from, from this uh, vision. Uh, so, but we are uh, working uh, mostly on multi-robot systems, and we are trying to answer three different questions. So the first one is, how do we manage a fleet of uh, robots? Uh, when you have uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, self-driving cars in a city, and that is what we call fleet routing. So today I will not be talking about uh, that topic, but that's something that we are also working on. Uh, the second question is uh, how to move safely. So in an environment shared with other robots, self-driving cars, humans, pedestrians, uh, bikers, and how do we account for that interaction with uh, all those other participants? So this is motion planning, and this is what I will focus on in today's talk. Uh, but that will be the second part, uh, because first I would like to give a brief uh, overview of uh, some other work that we have done. And that is answering a third question, that is how can a team of robots do something together? And maybe also with a human. So how could a human interact with a team of robots? And that's what we call multi-robot coordination. And I will just briefly talk about it in the first part of the talk. Uh, if you are interested, uh, just ask questions there and we can have a discussion about that part. Uh, and then we will move on to the, to the motion planning for self-driving cars. That, that will be the, the main uh, focus. So yes, I was mentioning, so, so the, one of the challenges is this interaction with humans in crowded environments. Here you see an example from a video 
uh, from our uh, work. Uh, this is recorded in the cyber suit. Uh, you see the small mobile robot, it's a jackal with some sensors on top and it's capable of perceiving the environment, perceiving the human and making a prediction of how the human is going to move. This is now in, in the three ME corridors. Uh, and then it's uh, planning its motion to avoid this pedestrian, taking into account how it is going to, to move. As I will be uh, going in detail in, into this uh, aspect uh, uh, today, but there is another type of interaction that we have to, that our robots will have to handle. It's the interaction with the environment as well. So both the humans and the environment. And we recently started a project uh, together with uh, several of my, my colleagues in, in the cognitive robotics department and in um, TBM, uh, where we are going to look at uh, how can we apply this in, in an environment that is really shared with humans, so a supermarket environment. So this is within the AI for retail lab, uh, where we will be using a robot like the one you see there that will be capable of uh, uh, picking uh, uh, things in the store, placing them in some other places and doing that while there are people moving around. So it will have to uh, think about all these complex interactions both with customers on the store as well as the environment itself. And that you, you will hear more from that in the future from us. Uh, uh, now, another type of interaction that, uh, that uh, we need to take into account is interaction with other robots. And uh, that is the, the multi-robot setting, really. So I did my PhD at ETH Zurich uh, and in collaboration with Disney Research. And uh, now it's around seven years ago. So this picture is now a bit old, this seven, eight years uh, old. So we did a new type of display. Those were the, the pixel bots uh, that you can see here. And it was a new type of display where the pixels are mobile. So instead of having uh, millions of pixels like you have in the screen that you are looking at now, every pixel was a mobile robot. And we could control its uh, color, but also its position. And using uh, a lower number of them, so in this picture is 50. So using a small number of them, we were able to display uh, images, we were able to display animations. And uh, we also demonstrate this in many uh, uh, live uh, venues. So like this one here that you see a kid that wanted to interact already with the robots. Uh, at that time, there was no interaction. So it was a fully pre-programmed, uh, animation where the robots will transition through a series of movements to be to tell a story but then we we wondered okay could we have a better interaction with such a system where we have multiple robots the first thing that we did is our system was able to display images so you can just have a drawing display like what you see here in your computer you can draw something you can pick a robot you can move it around and that way you can interact with it but then we say, okay, we want something a bit more intuitive. So we move uh, into gesture-based control. So here we had a Kinect uh, that is uh, recognizing the human gestures. And then the human was able to control uh, the, the shape. Here, one thing to note is that when you have multiple robots, there are many degrees of freedom and you cannot really control them one by one. So what we did was to use a lower representation. So a, a series, a, a small subset of uh, degrees of freedom that the human could uh, interact with. So like the position of the face, of the mouth or the shape of the mouth or, or uh, things like those. So instead of controlling every robot independently, it will control some higher level representation of the team of robots. And on top of that, another thing that we tried uh, for the interaction was to uh, use a, a, an iPad. Uh, so again, remember this is uh, from eight years ago. So, uh, and there, uh, we were running all the algorithms on this iPad and you could think of having real interaction both with the robots, but also with the environment. Like here, you could have a team of robots playing soccer and uh, you could be controlling some of them. So that was another way to interact uh, with a team of robots. Uh, here we had direct control over each robot. But you could also have augmented reality games where uh, your robots will be doing something and maybe your task is to, to pick some things on the environment and with multiple players. So these were some things that we tried for, for multi-robot uh, interactions, so human swarm interaction, where uh, mostly it was uh, going to a lower uh, representation. Instead of controlling all the degrees of freedom one by one, controlling a subset of uh, more high level degrees of freedom. And uh, 
moving forward, uh, we, we have uh, several projects uh, in the lab uh, that uh, just started or are starting now, where we are also applying this type of ideas to teams of uh, drones. And there, uh, one of them is uh, with the uh, AI uh, police lab uh, here in the Netherlands. And there we are looking at uh, multi-robot coordination and also learning uh, to better coordinate between the team of robots and also with a human operator, where the human operator will be on command, uh, so in command of the team of robots, controlling some high level degrees of freedom, but the robots themselves should be must be autonomous to be able to navigate safely in the environment and collaborate with each other. So that's a project that uh, we are starting right now. Uh, so we will be uh, busy with that one also uh, for the coming uh, years. And yeah, I think that yeah, that was it for this part. So that's a bit the overview of uh, what we have been busy with, uh, with multi-robot systems and uh, human swarm interaction and uh, where we are going uh, in the future. So if there is any question about uh, this part, uh, then I think this is the best time to ask them. Otherwise, I will move to the, the main topic that was the, the one on self-driving cars and uh, interacting with other traffic participants. Any questions? I, I, well, I, could, I, I could ask a question. Uh, Ming Chen is here. Uh, yeah, just thinking uh, now, uh, the, there's actually a thin line between uh, remote control and uh, interaction, I think. Mm -hmm. And if I think about human behavior, actually we also are sometimes remotely controlled in a crowded mm -hmm. environment where mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. maybe just follow another person. So we give the responsibility for routing mm -hmm. to another person. So mm -hmm. is there a real difference between the two? Yeah, so I, I think there is a, that, that's one difference. And it does, I mean, there is one level of interaction that is when you don't have any direct control. So like what you see here in this video that the, the drones are navigating and the humans are also navigating in the same environment. So mm -hmm. that's a level of interaction where there is clearly no control over the drones di directly. And mm -hmm. you can still influence their behavior depending on how you move. Yeah, and so then the other, the other yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, the other question is when the human is actually controlling the team of robots in some way. So where is the line between interaction with a team of robots versus control? And I think there is another level that is the one of being on, in control or being on, on command or in command. And uh, the difference is that in one case, you will really control how every robot moves in the team. Then you are really controlling everything. And that's, that's really not scalable. And the other one will be more, you could be in command. So you could tell the team of robots, go and see this thing or go and inspect this area. And then the robots themselves will be, uh, will have enough cap capability or intelligence to perform that task out, out, uh, autonomously. So it's a bit like a horse in some sense that uh, you, you, you only give high, high level commands uh, or uh, uh, a military st a strategies that will only give high level commands to the troops. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are multiple levels uh, and it, it depends a bit. So, so I would say there are several different levels of interaction and, and control and command. Okay. And uh, like humans, humans uh, make uh, heuristic decisions yeah. as, uh, without full information. So just based on limited information, you make your decision. So uh, the example I gave you, you can follow a person because you assume that he can see uh, the way in front of him, but you cannot see yeah. it. So, um, do you use the same principles? Well, so... Uh, you give, uh, well, make a decision to follow someone. Right? So. <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, uh, handling uncertainty and, and, and so on, that, that's hard for robots uh, still at the time. So many of the things that you see here, or except for the, the things at the end of the presentation, are in some sense deterministic. So like uh, here for the pedestrians, we were making a constant velocity assumption for them. Uh, so if we want a, a robot that uh, reasons about all the possible scenarios uh, and all the possible outcomes of all the actions mm -hmm. uh, and, and their impact on, on, on the environment and the robot, that, that's really hard. 
But I will come back to that point uh, okay. uh, later on. So I will okay. not talk more about that uh, point. So you will, okay. I will discuss, uh, discuss it a little bit uh, later on for the case of the self-driving car. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, can I ask a question? I put my hand up, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I cannot see them, so. <laughs> okay, good, sorry, sorry, okay. I'm just very curious about the use case uh, for the Office of Naval Research and the Police. Um, I'm, I guess um, the assumption is that these two people who are working, walking around uh, would be people who are, they're not the controllers, is that, it was kind of unclear to me. And it seems that the idea is to, um, that the drones would be at the height mm -hmm. of their, it's almost like eye level. Um, I'm not sure if they're really eye level in terms of power, but like mm -hmm. eye level in terms of like almost um, physically. And I'm just wondering why this was a choice, like what kind of use case is requiring okay um, so yeah so for this video in particular it, it we were just uh, uh, showing collision avoidance so the, the robots are just moving from a to b back and forth uh, so there is not not more than that uh, we look in the past on uh, aerial cinematography and videography so that's something that these drones could be doing while moving in the environment so they could be recording these these uh, targets so that's one uh, uh, scenario and uh, in particular, what we wanted to do for what we are uh, working on is on kind of high level scene understanding where you have multiple robots and they will have to go into an environment and they have to collect information. And then in the case of the police, uh, they might want to do something with that information afterwards. But uh, this team of robots should be able to, to go in an environment that is changing and they should be able to share information with each other and they should be able to, to understand what's going on. Uh, uh, and we are not there yet, so that's, that's our vision. That's where, where we are planning to go. So uh, that uh, they can, and one case will be the one of uh, yeah, collecting information uh, and recording uh, targets uh, or going in an unknown environment and uh, gathering information in a distributed manner. So are you saying that these drones are actually coordinated, meaning that they're looking at what each other sees and also yes, reacting? Yes, 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 that's correct. <laughs> so, so we are looking at the methods on how to share the information between the multiple drones. Uh, in the case of uh, the police, for example, you can think of that there is a central computer that is also uh, communicating with all the drones, uh, but it could also be distributed that each drone communicates with each other and shares some information. And one thing we are looking at is what information should be shared between the drones uh, and when and with whom and with whom. Very interesting. Also for our conceptions of meaningful control. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, but yeah, so uh, uh, sorry, I, I'm not going more on detail on these topics, but uh, I just wanted to point out that we are working on them. So if you are interested or want to hear, uh, hear more, you can reach out to me and then we can discuss more in detail for these topics. Okay. Any questions or move forward? I'm not sure yeah, how think, much time think, do we have. I, I think, we don't have much time, that's the problem. So we have 23 okay. minutes left. So if, uh, yeah, okay. if we could just uh, go through the okay. final part of the presentation, we hopefully <laughs> will have some questions and then. And yeah, some questions. okay, sounds good. So maybe I just skip some parts uh, as I see a fit. So basically, well, self-driving cars, uh, we don't need to do uh, much of an introduction. So uh, now you might be stuck in traffic, uh, especially before the Corona times, or, or maybe if everyone goes by car after the Corona times, and no one really likes to be stuck in traffic, right? So some will say that autonomous cars will contribute to, to making uh, transport reliable, safe, efficient, comfortable, and clean. So basically they will solve many problems with, uh, uh, with transportation, right? Uh, Maybe some of these will be solved, others not, but for today I will focus on how can self-driving cars actually make our uh, roads uh, safer. And uh, yeah, as I, I mentioned before previously, so uh, if we have a highway environment, uh, there are commercial solutions that, like the autopilot in, in Teslas. So it, it's a hard environment, especially to have it working 100% of the time with rain, uh, snow and so on. But we know more or less how to do it. Uh, on the other hand, if we to an that that you uh, Google or uh, Uber or many other companies are testing already self driving cars in urban environments. So more or less, uh, it's already in pilot phase. But if we want to have uh, uh, cars that navigate in really urban environments like our cities. 
uh, in the Netherlands, that's really much harder because there is much more interaction with other traffic participants, uh, like humans, uh, pedestrians, bikers, other uh, vehicles going up and down uh, bridges where you don't see what's going on. So it's uh, really hard. And this is the, the scenario where we are focusing on our research, so really accounting for the interaction with other traffic participants. Uh, and in order to solve that, uh, self-driving cars will have to be able to reason about what's going on. So here, your self-driving car will have to, to be reasoning about what is happening here. Uh, is that the person going to let me pass or not? And it needs to reason about this in a split seconds. So reasoning about all these uh, possibilities of the future and uh, moving uh, safely. So that's really hard. So the, the, for those that are not familiar with uh, autonomous vehicles and motion planning, so the way this works is typically we have an environment with a, a robot and other agents, then we will make some observations. So the robot will make some observations of the environment, will update its belief of uh, what it thinks that is happening around itself in the world. And with that, it will uh, uh, decide how to move in the environment. So that's the motion planning part. Uh, that computes a set of inputs, so a steering angle, acceleration for the case of the car. And then it will continue doing this loop all over time as it moves in the environment. So for our work, uh, we in, in my group, we focus on the motion planning part. So, so once the robot perceives the environment, how does it decide what to do and how to move? And motion planning is then to generate uh, safe trajectories for a, a robot or a car. So I will use them, yeah, uh, both uh, robot and car, they are the same to me. And uh, here you can see an example. So it will have to choose how does it move in order to, to do this uh, overtaking safely. So that's motion planning in short. And then uh, what we need to take into account is we need to take the global objective. So where does this robot uh, want to go? Uh, the, the environment, also the robot dynamics. So how can it move? And also the belief of the environment of other agents behavior. So this is how they behave in the environment. And all this goes into the, what we call motion planner, uh, that in particular we use something called receiving horizon uh, optimization. And that one will then compute the, the inputs for the, the vehicle. I will just give you a brief overview uh, uh, of, of how we do this trajectory optimization, because I, I think it's important to understand how uh, inside the robot, uh, it's how the robot is actually thinking about the problem and how is it computing its motion in the environment. So the way that uh, this works is we use something called model predictive control, where we have our uh, robot, and maybe we have a reference path that it wants to follow. This could be the, the center of the lane where the car is moving. And we also have a, a model. We have a model of how the robot uh, can move, and we can forward simulate how this uh, robot is going to move in the environment. And we can discretize time. So what we have done in this example is we discretize the future, future time into uh, four time steps. And that will be our prediction window for which we predict what the robot is going to, to do. Then we can define a cost uh, per time step. Uh, so here in red, the red arrows, it could be just the deviation between where the, the car is and the uh, center of the lane. And this will be our cost term for each uh, time step in the future. Then we will add them all up. So we sum all the uh, cost terms for every time step. That will be our cost function. And uh, what we actually want is we want to minimize that cost. So we are going to formulate an optimization problem where we minimize these cost terms, where we have a cost term for each stage in the future, uh, given the, the, the prediction uh, of, of where we think the vehicle is going to be. Uh, given the inputs uh, U sub K here that we plan to give to the uh, vehicle in every time step. So this will be our cost function. And then what the cost is, uh, you can design it. So this cost function in every time step can have many different shapes. So one could be this error with respect to the reference, the middle lane, but it could be many other different things. And then we will have a, a set of uh, constraints. So like the dynamics of the vehicles so cars cannot move sideways so we need to take that into account uh, or they might have a maximum speed so then this is a constraint optimization uh, luckily then we can solve uh, this constraint optimization problem with the state-of-the-art solvers and that will give us the optimal inputs for the vehicle for this time uh, uh, window 
And uh, we then uh, apply the first feasible input for the next time step. The vehicle will then move and this uh, shifts over time. And we keep doing this uh, many times per second. So typically 10 times per second or more, we will continue to solving this optimization to minimize a cost uh, subject to the constraints. And that is what was running in the video that I showed already before. So you saw, see it here also in, in the, the visualization is what the robot is uh, seeing and the predictions that is making of the environment. Uh, it sees the obstacles, it sees the moving people, and then it plans a trajectory to follow a, an aid path in the environment safely. And it will adapt its position and velocity to avoid the, the pedestrians as uh, the robot encounters them in the environment. But we already saw most of it. Uh, why do we use MPC or model predictive control? It's because we can, it allows us to include different things. So we can take into account multiple objectives, we can also have, well, you then have to weigh them. So that's another question. You can define multiple objectives, then you add them all up, but then probably you as a designer will have to tune the weights of all these different uh, objectives. Uh, so maybe that's something to, to look at, uh, but it can handle multiple objectives. You can have also constraints uh, that you want to satisfy when you're moving, uh, like the vehicle model. And you can also have predictions of what is going to happen in the future, both for the, the car or the robot, as well as for the environment. And it's a very flexible framework. Okay, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the math. Um, but if you want to see it, it's in the paper below, or you can ask me. So at the end, it looks something like this, where we have uh, the cost function, this one up here. So this is a more realistic cost function where we have the time horizon. These are the n steps in the future. And we have a tracking error with respect to the, the middle lane, and then we maybe penalize also the, the inputs not to have to, to aggressive maneuvers. And then we have all these constraints, uh, like to satisfy the limits on the speeds and also the dynamics of the vehicle. And this one here, it's an important one. That's the one to avoid collisions with other uh, uh, things that are in the environment. And then we minimize this uh, constraint optimization problem. And uh, it's uh, non-convex, which means that it's very hard to solve. But luckily, there are uh, people that specialize on solving this type of problems, and there are solvers available online, such as ACADO or Forces Pro, that you can use to solve such a problem. And if you put it on a car, then this is what uh, happens. So this is uh, on our self-driving car from the department, together with the Intelligent Vehicles Group. And here, the self-driving car is perceiving the, the, the pedestrian that goes on the way. Uh, it makes a model of how the pedestrian is uh, reacting. And that goes into the motion planner that then uh, decides how the, the car should move in order to avoid the pedestrian, as you can see here. So we focus on the motion planning and then the perception in this case comes from the group of uh, Dario Gabriela and uh, Julian Coy. And uh, yeah, so, so that is the base uh, framework. So there, there was no interaction. I would say that that's just a controller that uh, um, has a prediction and then uh, avoids collisions, but then it's very flexible, so you can add, by changing the cost function, you can do other things. So we also tried uh, to, to do a visibility maximization. So here the car uh, tries to maximize uh, what it sees in front of another car when overtaking, and that can be encoded in the cost function as well. Uh, but the interesting problem is that of interaction. So let, let me ask you a question, and it's going to be hard because we are not in an audience, but uh, if you were driving your car here and you are going to merge into this uh, uh, road with many cars, you might uh, be waiting there forever. Would you actually wait forever there? Uh, most likely, uh, if you are driving there, you will not wait there forever. So what you will do is uh, somehow you will notch your way in. So you will move a bit forward or when you see that someone maybe is slowing down or the gap is maybe uh, big enough, then you will kind of hope for the best to start moving a bit and see if the other driver lets you pass. And if the other driver lets you pass, then you merge uh, safely. If the other driver ignores you, then you probably stop again and try uh, a bit later. So there is uh, some level of interaction. So your actions will also affect what the others do and then what they do also affects you. And this is what we are trying to incorporate uh, that it's a hard problem in motion planning because the robot uh, or the car must understand how its future behavior changes the behavior of other agents. 
it also uh, and and how those interactions are going to change uh, with multiple agents over time and the question is how can we actually encode this interaction in the in the planner in a way that is uh, safe and that we can solve in real time because we need to solve it in real time if we, if we want to run it in a, in a car uh, so there are basically uh, two ways to do that so one is to coordination when robots can communicate on the interest of time i'm going to uh, skip that one so that's uh, one way uh, you can consider that there is vehicle to vehicle communication and then everyone communicates uh, and everyone exchanges their plans uh, maybe i just show a video of that so that's what you see here so you could have communication vehicle to vehicle communication then everyone plans up a, a, a trajectory exchanges with the neighbors and they iterate uh, to agree on uh, plans that are safe for everyone. So if you run that on a set of vehicles, you can get uh, very efficient uh, behaviors, like you see here, a very efficient intersection where everyone goes crisply to the middle and somehow very narrowly they avoid everyone. But this will only work if uh, you have a good communication and everyone communicates. And it would look a bit crazy if you're in that car, probably. You might be a bit scared because you really need to trust the system and that everyone is communicating uh, properly. In reality, not everyone is going to communicate. So we also need predictions of what other traffic participants are going to do. And then we need to encode that interaction. So think of uh, someone that drives the car, but it's not a self-driving car or a, a bicycle driver, they will not really communicate with you. They will not exchange their trajectories. So you need to, to be able to make predictions. So this, this is what we call interaction. So now you recall this figure from before. So it's the, the typical loop for an autonomous vehicle. So now what it's new is this red arrow. So this one here is the interaction part. So now the actions of the robot, so what the, the car is going to do in the future, the robot will do in the future, it's going to have an influence also on the other agents. And uh, that is not trivial, and that is what we need to actually encode in our planner. So this will be a loop so, uh, where we need to gently estimate what everyone is going to do and uh, plan accordingly, uh, based on what we think that they will do, uh, what we do, what we do. And then there is this recursion loop that, that and then, it depends how many recursions you want to do, I guess. Uh, but it uh, is this recursion loop of your actions affect them uh, and, and so on. Uh, let me skip this one. So this is a probabilistic method and maybe I will just talk about this other method. So one way that uh, we look at it was by uh, very recently uh, together with uh, my collaborators at MIT. And this is the work of uh, Vilko Svartik, so the PhD student uh, that I was working with uh, there at MIT. Um, so we look at the problem of social dilemmas. So those are situations in which the collective interests are at odds with the private interests. And that's the case where, that, like the one I explained before of self-driving cars. So the way we model this is by using something uh, called social value orientation. Uh, that comes from the uh, psychology and, and the human uh, uh, behavior uh, literature and basically it tells you or captures uh, what are the human preferences and if uh, in a social dilemma and it captures that in a circle where this angle here uh, will identify whether you are pro-social or you're individualistic or you're competitive or well there are many other things that you could be but those are very unlikely so most people are in this range, so either pro-social, individualistic, or uh, competitive. And we wanted to encode that. So we wanted to understand uh, whether the other traffic participants, how do they behave? What type of drivers are they? So that we can plan better. So studies on human preferences, uh, uh, they say that humans uh, are re these uh, red dots. Um, here you have the references below. So around 90% of the individuals are either pro-social, or individualistic, so it's 50% and 40%. Uh, so that, I don't say that, that comes from those studies, I don't know. Uh, but uh, that's what we are trying to then understand uh, uh, for our self-driving car. And we believe that if our self-driving car can understand how the other drivers are in real time, then it will be able to navigate better in urban environments. So how do, do we do that? So first of all, we, we need to, to use this social value orientation. And for us, it's useful because we can use it to, to weigh our own utility. So the utility of the, the self-driving car versus the 
water utility factors. So this will be the utility or the cost uh, that we will try to optimize for. And uh, with this angle, the social value orientation, we are uh, weighing our own reward versus the reward of, of the other. And then that uh, these rewards, we don't have a clue how they look like. So what we did was to estimate them or calibrate them from uh, real data, so highway driving in particular. And we use inverse reinforcement learning for that. So looking at uh, a lot of data from uh, highway driving, the, this is this data set here in NGSIM. So then with, from that data, we uh, learn this reward function. And then the question that we needed to solve in real time is uh, to uh, infer uh, the social value orientation of each driver to, to weigh those two rewards. And for planning, then that goes into a, what is called a best response game. Uh, where every agent maximizes uh, a utility. And the utility that you see here, you, you can see that this looks a bit like the, the model predictive control that I explained before. That's because actually in the background, we are also using model predictive control. So we have a time horizon. And here we have the, the utility for every uh, uh, other traffic participant. So the US weight weights it some here. Uh, so we will have the, this is the, the, the joint utility and then we solve for the Nash equilibrium, uh, trying to estimate what everyone is going to do uh, in an iterative manner. Um, but it's uh, maybe more interesting to, to look how it looks like. So here you can see an example where the human is uh, individualistic and then our self-driving car understands that and then it pulls behind. Or uh, it could be that the, the blue car now is prosocial, so it lets us uh, away and uh, the self-driving car can understand that and uh, merge uh, uh, faster. Uh, this also works in other situations like a uh, left turn. And I think I'm running out of time. So uh, here you can see an example where the blue car was individualistic. And the next one is an example where now the blue car, uh, it's uh, prosocial and it will slow down to let our self-driving car pass. Here the car, our self-driving car does not know how the, the other driver is. It estimates it in real time. So what we are doing is we are estimating in real time. You can see an example of estimating those social value orientation. So we try to estimate that based on distance, velocity, and other features. And, that, uh, and then we integrate that in the motion planner in a game theoretical uh, manner to improve the decision making and the predictions. Yeah. and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to go more in detail on all the math uh, behind this, but basically the idea is that one. Uh, we estimate the social value orientation of other uh, traffic participants to know how they are going to behave. And then we integrate that into our motion planner, that it's a model predictive control uh, to get in a coupled uh, manner uh, with uh, iterative best response game. And maybe someday uh, we, we are able to have our self-driving car uh, driving in, in a real city like Delft. Uh, in environments like this. So obviously this is driven by a human, so we are not there yet, but it gives you an idea of the complexity of the world where this self-driving car will have to, to operate. And yeah, that brings me to the end. Uh, so yeah, maybe I can take, I have, I think we have five minutes for questions or something like that. So maybe I just take questions now, the questions that are left. Thank you, Javier. Thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, yeah, we have uh, three to five minutes for questions. And uh, you can raise your hand if you want to ask it, or you can just jump in. I think I might, if I don't put it full screen, maybe I can see them. Um, yeah, can, can I ask a question? Um, so if, if, you, if you would observe a, a truck, uh, that well, its behavior might make a big difference whether it's empty or loaded, mm -hmm. especially for braking, of course. So. Um, how to deal with this? It, it, uh, does he first see how he breaks or, <laughs> uh, or does he yeah, make so, an assumption that it's full? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so here the, I mean, we, we have not looked at that problem in particular, the one of the tracks, so, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you will need a, a, an estimator for that. So indeed uh, you will have to, to estimate based on how it's breaking. Uh, so how fast it decelerates, uh, you will have to make a model. And maybe that's all uh, a black box model, but maybe it's also based on, on some physical models of uh, what you expect. And if you have that perception module that tells you 
how is it behaving, then you can put that into the motion planner. So you will need uh, an estimator indeed. Okay, thanks. Uh, Andrea had the question, right? Hey, hi, Javier. Thank you for uh, this presentation. So I wanted to ask you, when you chose the morality uh, foundations uh, measurement tool, which was SVO, did you consider other tools such as moral foundation theory or morality as cooperation? Yeah, not, not that deep. I mean, we, we were not, none of us was an expert on those topics. So, so we just had this idea that uh, uh, drivers are probably either selfish or pro-social, uh, and that's what we wanted to encode. So we wanted to encode whether they are going to let us pass or not. And uh, we found this uh, social value orientation, and that's the one we, we chose because it allowed us to encode that. But I'm not familiar with the, the other ones that you mentioned, so uh, I don't know. So maybe they are better. Uh, I have no clue, but maybe we can discuss that offline. <laughs> Great, thank you. So okay, the big question uh, would be then how, how can we transform that? So go from, from the, 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 those concepts to, that are abstract to, to a cost function that we can actually use uh, in the planner. So that, that's uh, the tricky part. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And maybe uh, probably the last question from Kathleen. Kathleen, you want to ask you yourself? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, so very interesting talk. Thank you very much. And uh, Javier, did you also do experiments in which you vary with the ratio of human versus automated drivers? No. No. So that one uh, was always uh, one self-driving car and the other ones was, uh, were uh, human-driven cars. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And we are also right. looking at the case of uh, that they are all self-driving cars. So we, we, we are not looking at the mixed case, but uh, there are several researchers that uh, are looking at that problem. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. That was quick. Maybe one more question from Nick. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your, uh, the, especially the last uh, part, the social value optimization uh, uh, study you showed. I was wondering, did you also uh, test like interaction between two agents that had overlapping conflicting uh, values, like two, two competitive, uh, like a competitive auto autonomous vehicle and a competitive human, for instance, and how did the interaction look like? Yeah, so, and the, 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 the framework itself, uh, so, so we decided to, so in all the experiments you saw, we decided to put the self-driving car prosocial, and that's because uh, we, we think that that's how it should behave, but also because it, it leads to, to nice uh, behaviors. The, the tricky part, if you put everyone uh, 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 aggressive, is that uh, someone will still have to let pass, right? And the, in this case, the self-driving car, it's uh, doing this uh, model predictive control. So we have constraints for collision avoidance. So what I, I expect in those cases is mostly the self-driving car will still let the human driver pass uh, because the car, it has constraints that it needs to be safe. Uh, uh, but that's... Uh, and that brings to an interesting question that is one of the tricky parts. So when, when we formulate that as a joint game, in some sense, we are also assuming that we know what the other uh, uh, drivers are going to do. So we need to have a good estimate or, or understanding of what they are going to do. We are, so if we understand that they are going to be aggressive, then the self-driving car will uh, avoid them because it's in the constraints. But if we believe or we estimate that they are uh, uh, prosocial or, or whatever, and they let us pass, and in the end they are aggressive, then we are making wrong predictions, and that could be dangerous. So that's why we are trying to estimate uh, this. But overall, there is a question that it's uh, how much do you trust your predictions, uh, and uh, how much do you believe that you can affect the behavior of others? So for instance, if my self-driving car uh, pulls in front, are they really going to let me pass or not? And you have to be careful how you model that. So. Uh, so that's a question. We don't have a good answer for that yet. Okay, thanks, Javier. Uh, we have at least three more questions here in the chat. Uh, okay. So it, it would be great if the if people who want to talk these questions contact Javier directly because we have to wrap up at this stage. Uh, so thanks, Javier, so much for for the very interesting talk and the insightful. Uh, answers to really good questions. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and uh, please reach out uh, with those questions. See you. Bye.
Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.